These are the two overarching goals or values that ought to drive things to minimize, uh, or at least in the 2005 report, to minimize the number of hospitalizations and deaths and then to preserve critical infrastructure. Initially they were not ranked and then the committees ranked them. So the question is, do you agree with those goals for vaccine allocation? So most of you agree, three quarters, one quarter. All right, you can see first that started out with 14 different uh, values or goals uh, uh, or principles that should guide. Now, one of, what's one of the problems of this kind of list? So, look, if you have to balance them, how many of you have ever had to balance a set of principles or a set of values in your life in a decision? Right? Almost all of us do, right? Do you balance 10? We have difficulty, most of us, balancing two and three. And to think about balancing ten creates a certain kind of problem. Cognitively, you know, if we have one principle, there is a certain drive to have one overarching principle, right? What's the appeal of something like utilitarianism in Mill's principle of the greatest good for the greatest number? Right? It's really simple, right? No competing other principle, you can figure it out. The amount of cognitive power needed to apply it, well, yes, there's practical issues, but at least you know what the principle is. If you've got ten competing principles, it's very hard. And at least most of us find it really difficult once we're beyond two or three principles. So you need to think about not just parsimony for parsimony's sake, but could we even cognitively, from a balancing standpoint, handle this many things. So if you look at the 2005 pandemic, plan and you unpack, you read the proposal, there's considerations of morbidity and mortality. There was an assumption that it was a kind of U-shaped curve that people at highest risk ought to be protected, or highest risk of death. Uh, worrying about the healthcare system being overwhelmed, that we would have a demand that would way exceed our capacity, that the workforce uh, might not be present because they'll be sick and some of them will opt out. And by the way, some of you who responded, even if you didn't get the vaccine, you'd show up. That may be your view, sitting comfortably in a chair here. When SARS hit Canada and uh, workers had to go in and they had no idea and people were dying from SARS, you had a very big drop-off rate, even in Canada, which has this sort of communal sense a little bit more than uh, other countries do. A large number of people were not willing to go in and be isolated from their families and care at a very high risk of transmission. This idea of critical infrastructure, estimates of what you needed to keep the electricity on, keep food going, keep water flowing, and then the production capacity. At that time in 05, we were talking about three to five million doses per week with two doses required per person. Just think about that. At the end of 10 weeks, you'd have 50 million doses which could vaccinate only 25 million people in a country that had 300 million people. So lots and lots of choices to be made here. So the, if you read the report, I think one way of understanding, and actually Bruce used this phrase, is you know, pilots go first, right? Your airplane, suddenly you have food poisoning, you can save someone from food poisoning, who do you save, right? Everyone on the plane is going to agree to the pilot, right? You want to lay on that plane. And the same thing happens, I think, in a public health emergency, right? You give priority to vaccine production people, 40, 50,000 people, and you give priority to healthcare workers who are actually going to take care of sick people. That does not seem like a very complicated idea. Now, how is this different from livers? Yeah. You can, you can make more vaccine. It's not an absolute scarce. Well, it is absolutely scarce. You still have not enough. But in what way is this different? Livers are sickest first. That's the UNOS rule. When you give somebody a liver, you're benefiting them, like that individual person, 
Whereas when you're giving a vaccine, you have the potential to be, um, you know, helping a lot more people. Yeah. In the case of livers, did anyone say the transplant surgeon gets it first? Was that a principle? Why not? Trans? It only trans the liver transplant only affects a very small amount of the population where the flu vaccine, where the flu is. Right, in a public health emergency, right, you want to make sure that you can respond to the emergency with your, in this case, vaccine production workers and healthcare workers. In the liver case, if one transplant surgeon doesn't survive, dies because they didn't get that liver, Right? You still have other transplant surgeons. You have an infrastructure that is going to work. So this is an important contrast between a public health emergency and a situation where it's, you've got absolute scarcity, but it's not a public health emergency. Here is a case where social worth might come into it, not because the doctors here and the vaccine workers are more valuable people in and of themselves, but because they're going to be helpful or instrumental in saving other people. Is that clear? Very important distinction to keep in your head. I will just throw it out as a rhetorical question and I won't answer it. If you are in Africa at the moment where there's a limited supply of antiretrovirals for people who have HIV, do you give it to the healthcare workers first or you distribute it in some other way without giving priority to health care workers. Just think about that. It might be your dinner time conversation. So after the pilots, as it were, the vaccine workers and the frontline health care workers, the real ethical question for us is who is next? So if you read the 2005 report, and notice this is in Appendix D, it says, the committee considered the primary goal of a pandemic response to decrease health impacts, including severe morbidity and death. Minimizing societal and economic impacts were considered secondary and tertiary goals. Right? Bruce emphasizes that they were undifferentiated initially, but then differentiated into this. Here's the primary goal, minimize death and morbidity. And you can see, again, this is to go over his tiers, Emphasizing, just for a second, tier 1A was the vaccine workers and the frontline healthcare workers. T tier 2 is sickest people, most likely to get flu and die from flu. Okay? That's 1B. So you have a very clear ordering where your number one principle is minimize mortality and minimize uh, uh, morbidity. And then you move down the list based upon who's most likely to die from this thing, okay? Tier two, healthy population older than 65. Why is that? Well, the U-shaped curve, over 65, whether you've got an illness or not. You're more likely to die. Six months old with one high risk condition. Then you can see tier three, funeral directors and embalmers, and all of you, unless you happen to be a funeral director or an embalmer, are down at the bottom. It was this ranking which struck me as being ridiculous. Healthy people were at the bottom. If you think that's wrong, then you have to ask your question, well, was that principle of minimizing death the right principle? So what are the driving forces behind the driving ethical values behind the 2005 HHS policy. Save the most lives. So, again, it is true that you have, if you look at instrumental value, the vaccine workers and the healthcare workers, but remember, they're instrumental, which means that they're, you're saving them not because they're really important in and of themselves. They don't have any special moral status. You're saving them because their ultimate goal is you're, they're going to save other lives. They're going to produce vaccine to save lives. They're going to care for people in the hospital to save lives. So the underlying goal here is very clearly, we're going to minimize that. We're going to save the most lives. So your, one of your ethical questions, I think, is, is that the right principle?
Uh, do that for years with disasters. Think of the Titanic. Okay, right. Think of other disasters. Burning house, Titanic. What do you do? You go in and you just save as many people as you can. Right? Although on the Titanic, what's the rule about getting into lifeboats? Women and children first. Just remember that. Okay? But if you're the rescuer coming upon the Titanic, you don't say, oh, we're just going to fish out women first. We just fish out as many people as you can. You run into a burning house, just get as many people as you can. So there is some intuitive appeal to this, right? And not just intuitive appeal, there's a real defense, right? I don't think John Stuart Mill would have any trouble saying, save the most people. That's a real maximizing principle, right? You can produce a lot of happiness by saving more people. So there is a real appeal to this. And one should not just throw it out. So what bothered me when I walked out of the meeting where Bruce presented this principle as guiding his allocation, why was I bothered? Because 65 plus were prioritized over younger people. I don't like old people. That is my reputation. <laughs> But that's after I criticized this, so yeah. The flu pandemic had like a W shaped curve, so the people in, like, in between like 20 and. Right. So this principle, the, the, the allocation here of, of uh, uh, say, the over 65 with multiple illnesses, the, under, uh, the young people with one illness, works for a U shape, doesn't work so well for a W shape, where healthy people are at way increased risk for dying. That's true, but. When you start out a pandemic, it's very hard to know which one you're facing, a U-shape or a W-shape. Based on the complete lives, the 65 plus people have already you know, lived their fair innings, whereas the people that are younger have no chance to live a complete life. I would rephrase that objection, which is? Um, the people that are younger have a, a better opportunity, or they have an opportunity to live a complete life. There's another value that you might want to take into account besides saving the most lives. Yes, that's important, and I don't think anyone can deny it's important, right? You can be Immanuel Kant or John Rawls, but even those two people, right, one who's really emphasizing equality, one who really wants to emphasize giving priority to the worst off, neither of them would say, shouldn't save a lot of lives, right? So you do want to emphasize saving a lot of lives. But what bothered me is it didn't seem to me that was the only principle, or maybe even not the most important principle in this kind of case. So we wrote that article that you read in 06, uh, somewhat critical of the 05 recommendations that had come up. And you know, in response, in an independent track also, because they were thinking about the same things, you heard from Bruce, they went out and they interviewed people, they did some public talking, they actually talked to a bunch of philosophers and other people who were thoughtful beyond the two advisory groups that they initially had, which were predominantly made up, correct me if I'm wrong, of flu experts and vaccine experts. And so they looked and they came to the conclusion, one of the most important findings of the working group analysis was that there is no single overriding objective for pandemic vaccination, rather there are several important objectives. So you see an immediate shift, as it were, from reducing or minimizing death and morbidity with a secondary goal to recognizing that there are multiple principles at stake here. Very important observation, it seems to me. The big ethical question, however, is what are those other important objectives? And how do we include them and how do we exclude them? So in the 2008 revision, at least on my reading, protecting those who are essential to the pandemic response, right? And they're going to care. We've all agreed that that's the pilot first. That's the instrumental value. But the instrumental value is only parasitic on some other value. Second, protect those who maintain essential community services. Third, protect children. Protecting workers who are at greatest risk of infection due to their job. In addition to these, the working group discussions highlighted the importance of maintaining homeland and national security. So here's a set of values. Now you may agree or may disagree with them, but this is an important set of values that all come into place rather than just one overriding value. Well, this is the 08 ranking. 
And you can see several important changes. And I would recommend you go through, I'm not, I can't in the time left for us go through all the changes. But you can see some critical occupations, pretty similar to before, little expanded. Then we have this high risk population of pregnant women, infants, and toddlers, which were nowhere to be found in the top tier before. So a new addition of younger people here. Then you have this uh, group, and notice that mortuary services actually moves up. <laughs> Always struck me as funny why this should move up. And then you've got this healthy, uh, high, um, healthy children, now recategorized as a high risk population, but they're completely healthy. And this was a group, right, that had previously been here. Then you've got high risk population and you've got rest of the population there. So a very different uh, set of priorities, but we could still argue whether this priority gets it right or not. 